Lori Houston's News for the Heart is dedicated to helping you give a voice to your own soul. Our hearts have the power to free us from pain and the struggles that keep us from awakening to our true essence. Join Lori now as we delve into our heart and soul to find the path that will open us to the possibilities and lead us to the life we love to live. And good afternoon. This is the News for the Heart. And today I have my awesome co-host, Tom Campbell, and we're going to talk a little bit about what's going on because there's some new and exciting things that are happening with Tom. I know that Donna and him did an interesting little, a little video, and it was about the new ways to explore consciousness, but there's a whole bunch of things that's, that's going on. So we're going to start there and, uh, Let's see where it goes. Okay. <laughs> so welcome, well, Tom. It's been it's been a little bit of a break we had. It's so. been like three months that we yeah. have not done this, so I kind of miss it. Now it's it feels good to be back uh, doing them again, Lori. So thanks for having the program and and inviting me on it. Yes. Well, yeah. Well, some things have been going on in uh, in the MBT world as far as ways to help people experience the larger reality themselves. Nice. Yeah, that's one of my, you know, one of, one of those Tom Campbell things is that I tell people, don't believe me, you have to experience it yourself. Until it's your experience, it's not your truth. All you can do is believe or not believe somebody else. You have to get your own experience, and it isn't that hard. You just have to work at it consistently. And the way people begin to explore the larger reality is generally by doing paranormal things. You know, they remote view, they tell, they communicate telepathically, they uh, get the, the information out of databases, they, they do things like that, you know, they use their mind to heal. So these are things that aren't hard to do. And they're not that hard to teach people to do. The biggest problem in doing them is is people's belief in materialism. Mm. Now, it's not like they have they believe in materialism because they were taught to believe in materialism. Materialism is just a part of our culture. You know, we in the in the Western world, particularly and mostly the world over, have this sense that the physical reality is the reality, that there really isn't anything else. And even if you're religious and think there's an afterlife, but still that's that's kind of a separate a separate thing. As far as our reality goes, we just live in this reality and the only way to get in some other reality is to die. That's if you're religious. If you're not religious, then we have this reality and that's it, that's the end. So that's kind of where it's been. And our culture has this deep and abiding belief in materialism. And partly that's because we now value and trust the word of science. Scientists have become the high priests of Western culture. The high priests being the people that tell the, everyone else what to believe. That's the role of the high priest to define what's believable and what's not. So now that's the scientist's role, not, not religion's role. And when the scientists say this is the way it is, well, people say mm, that must be the way it is because those science guys have a method, the scientific method, and, you know, they don't tell lies. They do experiments instead. But as it turns out, science is based on, you know, several beliefs, and they're just beliefs. They're, they're not facts. They're beliefs. And one of them is materialism and determinism. And why that's a problem for people, it's because their intellects have been developed very well over the last, you know, 20, 30, 40 years, you know, since they were in kindergarten, they've been working on developing their intellects. But they have not spent any time at all developing their intuition. So they're like adults in the intellect and like uh, not even as actually as intuitive as a two-year-old in their you know, intuitive skills. Matter of fact, many scientists and other materialists would say there is no intuition. That's a lot of nonsense. There's no intuition. That's just sometimes people are good guessers or they just get things because in their mind they put things together and suddenly they'll get an aha moment or something. But 
that's all done just inside their own head. So that's a problem because when you get unbalanced like that, where you have this, you know, very keenly developed intellect, and the tool the intellect uses is called logic. And logic is a very precise tool. So you if if you have that as your dominant way of dealing with reality, and most of us do because that's what gets us by from day to day. That's what we that's how we earn our money at our job. You know, we do things with our intellect. That's that's how we uh, separate the things that are true from the things that are false. You know, that's how we get good bargains in stores. We use our intellect to figure things out. So in our culture, that intellect is a necessary and wonderful tool. And our intuition, well, that kind of, yeah, sometimes works, sometimes doesn't, you know, it's kind of, I got this gut feeling, you know, and of course they're wrong as much as they are right for most people. So we don't trust that intuition much, but all of the paranormal things take place in the intuitive side. Every human being, I shouldn't say that, every consciousness, human beings, the avatar, every consciousness processes information in two separate methods. One is intellectually and one is intuitively. You know, we have those two ways of processing information. And if you put time and effort into developing that intuitive side, you'll find out it is just as reliable, just as accurate as the intellectual side, as the logical side. If you don't put any effort into developing, then you'll find that it's totally scattered and random and, you know, it doesn't seem to even exist. Right. And I imagine if you put zero effort into your intellectual side, that would seem like it didn't exist either. You know, you wouldn't be able to figure out anything. You know? Like, you know, the the people, you know, what is it? The guy who was raised by wolves, you know, story, right? That yeah. I don't know whether that's a myth or, or whether that's true, but you know, there's always somebody, some child being raised by wolves that comes back. And of course they don't know anything. They can't, you know, they don't reason, they don't think, they don't uh, read and write, they don't do analytical kinds of work. Now their minds can do things like, you know, smell scents better than we can, you know, they can know when, when to run and when to hide, things like that, how to find food, but they don't do analytical thinking, you know, they don't do, they don't do a lot of math or logic or that sort of thing. And they don't actually, that doesn't actually compute for them. You know, if you tell them something, you know, if A and B then C, they won't necessarily get that. It won't make sense. So anyhow, here we are, very unbalanced people with a very highly developed intellect and no intuition at all. And that hurts people when they try to do paranormal things. They just can't do it because they can't get their intellect to sit down and be quiet. And it's essential that it does that because paranormal things are not available to the intellect. They're only available through the intuition. And the intuition is a different kind of space, different kind of processing. You don't figure things out in your intuition. Information just comes to you. You don't get linear sentences. It's not like, you know, you get a lot of, uh, of chatter. You just get information. Just suddenly, poof, you know, you just get knowledge. Sometimes you'll get linear sentences, but most of the time you just know things. You'll get little bits and pieces of maybe linear stuff, but you just know that something's right or something's true or that something's false, whatever. You, you get information in a lump. That's how telepathy works. Well, we, we humans interact telepathically all the time. That's part of the way we communicate. We just don't realize it. We don't understand it, but there's communications. And it's not just body language and language. There's a third path, and that's telecommunication, where you know what's going on in somebody's mind. You understand where they're coming from. 
And it's not because the way their eye twitched or, you know, they held their mouth. You actually know where they're coming from. And body language doesn't explain it. And they haven't told you in language yet. It's, in, it's information we pick up. We get that all the time. Sometimes we meet people and we just like them. Sometimes we meet people and we just don't like them. <laughs> and there's no reason for that. When we think about it, it's like, well, they didn't say or do anything to make me like them or dislike them. I just, you know, you just have these feelings. Well, that's because you are getting information. You're sharing data back and forth all the time in, you know, non-physical space. So that's, you know, that's why we teach these these paranormal things, these paranormal attributes, because it's not that the paranormal is really that important or significant all by itself, but in the process of learning to do paranormal things, you have to learn how to develop your intuitive side. You have to learn how to get rid of fear. You have to learn how to get rid of expectation. You have to get your intellect to sit down and be quiet and just watch, not participate. Because as soon as your intellect jumps in and wants to analyze or judge something, you know, you're, you're trying to talk to your dead Uncle Fred. And as soon as, you know, you say, okay, Uncle Fred, and you're out there, and Uncle Fred says, yeah, here I am. And the intellect says, oh, who was that? What was that? Did I just make that up? Or was that really Uncle Fred? See, the intellect jumps in and starts to judge the situation instantly. And as soon as the intellect does that, well, it's gone. Because that intellectual path doesn't transmit intuitive information. It actually prohibits it. It kills it when it jumps in front. And we are so habituated to our intellect running the show that our intellect has become, you know, uh, a tyrant. Our intellect has become the big boss. And when the intuition tries to do something, the intellect is right in there telling it what to do, judging it, analyzing, you know, and destroys the process. So getting people just to let go of that intellect is probably the hardest thing I have when I'm trying to teach people, particularly if these people are very left brain, you know, intellectual kind of people. You know, lawyers, doctors, Indian chiefs, uh, scientists, mathematicians, you know, on and on, uh, you know, plumbers, carpenters, you know, businessmen, anybody who makes a living by figuring things out and using their, their intellect to do that. Well, they're so intellect bound, they live in their heads all the time. And to, to let their intellect sit on the sidelines and not butt in front of the intuitive process is hard. So one of the new things that I've done is I've come up with a with a, I call it a, an imaginality game. That's, that's a, imaginality is half the word is imagination, the other half is reality. So I combine those two in a thing called Tom's Park. Tom's Park is a, is a massive place. It has lots of things going on in it. You know, it's, it's not really like Disneyland uh, or, uh, you know, Universal Studios. It's not, like that because it's not full of rides, but it is full of things to do. There's critters there, animals of which you can communicate with. Right. You know, I mean, you can communicate with animals here telepathically, but anyway, so, but there is, you know, lake to swim in, there's, there's boats, there's, you know, there's even jet skis for, uh, you know, the racers, there's hiking trails, there's horses to ride, there's a lodge with all kinds of things. There's a room in it that enables you to uh, get into point consciousness, uh, you know, has technology to get you into point consciousness. And there's another one with technology to uh, uh, help you get out of body and technology to, to let you communicate with other people telepathically and all the various par paranormal things, you know, get data out of databases and so on. There's a, there's a special room for that with technology to help you. You come sit down in a big chair and you've got buttons red, yellow, and, and green buttons here on your armchair, and you pull this thing down over your head. And anyway, there's a lot of, you know, there's process to it. Cool. And there are, uh, there's a travel agency there with canned tours, things that you can do, like beam up to a spaceship. 
Um, just lots of different things, you know, that you can do. And the way it works is so the, the key idea here is that you start with your imagination. So you start in this park with your imagination. <clears throat> now, the way to practice letting go of your intellect is to practice with your imagination. You have to imagine, get a storyline going, get something going, and let that go until it begins to run itself. In other words, until you're not feeding it anymore. It's a storyline that just keeps on going. Now, all of us do that. When you imagine things, when you imagine what's going to happen when you go to the party, or if you're imagining, oh, this relationship you have with the significant other, you know, that you're building and developing, and you imagine that, that takes on a life that's its own. You're not making up all the pieces. You start making them up, but eventually it just starts to roll on its own and, <clears throat> and it unfolds however it does. Well, when it starts unfolding however it does in a daydream, that's when your intellect is sitting down and being quiet. It's not working. So what you need <clears throat> is a story, a good story that you can get into. Well, Tom's Park has that good story. Like I say, it's got beaches and and you know all sorts of things to do. Interaction games. It's got uh, sports. It's got a sportsplex where all kinds of sports and things are going on. Lots of activities to do, which are all designed to be active in all five senses. It, there's lots of things there, not only to see and to hear, but to taste and to smell and to feel, you know. So the beginner starts and just practices using their imagination in all five senses. Mm. Oh, they walk up to Uncle Tom's Grill and they get an ice cream cone, you know, and then they eat, they lick the ice cream cone. So that's sight. It's touch and feel, they hold the cone and it's taste, and they lie down on the beach on the, in the sand. Well, that's tech, you know, that's a lot of texture involved in that. And this sand is special sand. It's, it's like powder and doesn't stick to your body. You know, you can stand up and you're perfectly clean from the sand. Whether you're wet or dry, it doesn't matter. Sand doesn't stick to you. So it's kind of a magical place. And you don't need to bring your bathing suit because whatever you However you go there, you just walk through this little changing kiosk and immediately you walk in one side in street clothes and out the other side in beachwear with a towel on your arm, you see? So it's very convenient. There's all the little details in life that are just not fun. They just happen kind of magically. <clears throat> so anyway, this is Tom's Park with, uh, for hikers like yourself, there's lots of trails up in the high mountains or in the meadows, you know, there's flower gardens, there's a, there's a, uh, there's a uh, hot springs. Nice. And these hot, these hot springs have uh, the, the natural uh, minerals that are in it and so on are extremely healthy. So they're very healing hot springs. And there's certain processes you go through in the hot springs to get rid of all your problems and, and the weight that you carry around to get rid of it. There's uh, <clears throat> a, a lily pond that's full of uh, lotus flowers and, and lily pads and frogs and fish, and you can sit there on benches. There's special benches you can sit on that are portals and takes you off to another reality. So there's just all sorts of things to do. But the, the beginner starts with just imagining in five senses getting involved in the jet ski track. There's a track that you have to go around. It's laid out in the lake and it's a time track. So how it's how fast you go around it. So there's a lot of very sharp turns and things like that. And there's some, some uh, <clears throat> things that pop up that'll pop up in your path and you have to miss them. If you hit them, it takes 10 seconds off your, off your I mean, it adds 10 seconds to your time. Um, you know, that kind of thing. There's a giant squid that uh, tends to uh, drag boats that are going the fastest, uh, slow them down. There's water spouts that uh, spray you and so on. So it's on this track and it has all these things on it and to see how fast you can get around the track. And times of, are uh, 
displayed in the Uncle Tom's Grill up on a big uh, sports plex uh, board. So anyhow, it's it's got a lot of detail in it. I'm just telling you two or three percent of it. You know, there's lots and lots of detail in it. So once you get good at five cents imagination, then you also will get good at letting the story unravel on its own. Because when you're imagining in five senses, you don't have time to think about what's going to happen next. Your ability to, to um, I guess, create, if you will, is kind of maxed out just in doing the all five senses. So it's easier when you're busy like that. When you're very busy and consumed, <clears throat> it's easy to let the story roll on by itself. It's hard if you're just kind of sitting in a meditation state with absolutely nothing going on. You know, now it's 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 difficult at that point to maintain that that state of open, quiet, you know, a good meditation state I call point consciousness. You tend to drift ideas and thoughts come in and all sorts of stuff happens. But when you're really focused on things happening, particularly things happening fast, like a jet ski or swimming or whatever, there's there's some interesting creatures that live in the lake as well. Sunken pirate ships, uh, snorkeling, um, uh, you know, what do you call that? Uh, you go underwater with the tanks and the mask, uh, scuba. There's, there's that, yeah. So there's all this stuff there, and enough of it is multi-sensual that it should take no more than, oh, I don't know, 10, 20, 30 trips at most before even the most left brain person gets to the point that they can let their imagination run in all five senses without having to consciously make up the story. Just let the story unwind as it happens. Well, that is 90% of the problem they're having is just being able to do that. So if they can do it that way, then what I have for them is that I have arranged that the larger consciousness system also has Tom's Park as a virtual reality, which means like an out-of-body experience, where it's not them making it up, they're getting a data stream from the larger consciousness system which is a normal out of body, that's what you get. And now the larger conscious system is leading them on a journey or an adventure or a, a whatever. And the system tends to give people experiences with lessons in them. You know, this typically works like that. So a person starts with their imagination, they get into the Tom's Park thing, and as soon as they get into it to the point that they're they don't they're no longer aware they're making it up. Then the data stream from the larger conscious system just takes up right in that space, whatever they're doing, whether they're jet skiing or riding a horse or whatever, it just picks up on that and then starts playing a different data stream. So it's a, it's a, a slick way to get into an out-of-body state. And you end up then getting this adventure um, from the LCS data stream rather than from your imagination. So you start with the imagination and end up in a in and out of body. And eventually, you know, in the beginning, you won't know when that transition takes place. Matter of fact, you have to just let it take place. If you try to spot it, if you try to say, ah, is it now nah, that's it, it's taking place now, you'll destroy it. That's again, that's your intellect judging and analyzing, trying to, you know, will destroy the process. So it'll take practice. But all you have to do is just experience. Don't judge. Don't try to see the transition point. Just experience. And eventually, you will realize after, I don't know, a dozen experiences or so, that the experiences that are coming to you have elements in them that you couldn't possibly make up. They're just not you. They're not elements that you would imagine, okay, you can imagine a jet ski, you can imagine riding a horse, but there's going to be things happen in these outer bodies that are just, they will feel other to you. They won't feel like they came out of you. And sometimes you'll get things that are very evidential. You'll get information that you can check to see whether that information that you got is actually information that's here. You know, mm -hmm. you'll do things that have to do with what's going on in 
our virtual recall virtual reality we call the you know the physical universe so you'll get some evidential stuff too the lcs will provide some of that so that's kind of what's going on that's the deal and in about three weeks i should have this out most all the text is written it's in editing right now after it gets in editing i'm going to kind of stick it together in the right form and then i send it to the lady who's doing the design and she's going to make it look spiffy and cool and and nifty then when she's done then uh pamela's going to probably put it up on uh, uh kindle and she may even make a book out of it and put it on uh you know uh amazon um uh, they have a pod they yeah. do pod books at amazon you know let them make pod books yeah. and i'm thinking two or three weeks to a month it ought to be out there so yeah. it's a it's a tool that it, it's there's a there's so much to do and i like i say i just touched on it you know, there's a movie theater where you can go in and sit down and view and view uh, the past database. So you can look at, uh, you know, past lives. You can look at, you know, where did you start feeling insecure? You know, where did you start feeling not good enough? What happened in your childhood that made you feel that way? And you can sit down there and and uh, there's technology in there that'll put that on the big screen in front of you. Mm. There's live. There's a library where you get to get information from, oh, I don't know. I don't even remember the details of that. You get information from the people that, that know most about it. Uh, it's, it's kind of a mind meld with, you know, with other people. There's, there's, a, there's a place where you go meet people and where you meet them is in a lodge. I've got a lodge there with dining rooms, you know, uh, formal dining rooms, even you can go to dinner. There's staff there that you can interact with. There's a thing called uh, the uh, uh, Paper Tiger Fear Clinic, there where you can work on getting rid of fears. You'll get a you will get like a therapist there or a, a person to, to work with you, and you can come back and work with them time after time. They'll get to know you. You'll get to know them. Uh, you know the staff is available to help to help the uh, the visitors in the park. You know, if you're there by yourself, you can get a, a staff member to, you know, have dinner with you, to, uh, you know, spend time with. So it's a, it's not just things, it's people too. Interacting with people, creating relationships, making friends. Uh, anyway, it's a... Wow. Yeah, it's a big, it's a kind of a big deal. Now, it's not that big as far as a book goes. It's like... A little over 40 pages, that's all. Oh. And a couple of pages, you know, there's a map that shows you the park. You know, there's a map that goes with it and a, a floor plan of just the, the main floor of the, uh, and the and the second floor of the lodge. And then there's a downstairs to the lodge that just has all sorts of marvelous things in it. So, oh, well, you can get your nails done. You can get a pedicure. You can get your hair done. You can walk through a little kiosk and come out the other side and be 18 years old if you want. <laughs> so, yeah, wow. it's just see, it's meant to be fun and engaging, okay. and to stimulate. So, what I've done is I've created all of these things to do and be, but I lead the person right up to the point of what it is to do and how to do it, but I don't define what happens. Right. I leave that to them. So, all through it. I lead you up to the threshold of happening, and then the happening has to be out of your own imagination. And then you get involved with it to the point that you forget you're imagining it, and then you're out of body because now you've been connected to a data stream from the LCS, and most anything can happen after that. Right. So that's, the, that's what's going on. Tom's Park is what it's called. And uh, it's just an idea came to me and then started to build. And, and uh, I actually started the idea with a, uh, in, a, in a course that I give for advanced explorers. People have gone through the course where I teach, you know, how to develop your, your intuitive side and do paranormal things. And 
and like that. And I tell people there that you use tools. Now, people make tools. People who work with their intuitive side often have tools that they use. The only active ingredient is your focused intent. But sometimes tools make it a whole lot easier to focus that intent, you know? So there are healing tools that you can use, and there's tools for this and tools for that, and all the tools are are things you make up that help you focus your intent on a particular thing or outcome. Well, this park is just full of tools. It is a tool. It's a tool for people to use and to use regularly. It's not a one-off. It's the something you do like an hour a day or an hour a week or whatever time you put into it. And over time, if you've been there 10 or 20 times, you'll get e it'll get easier and easier to imagine in five senses and then to imagine and let the story run on itself. Right now, most people, if you ask them to imagine things, they don't imagine in five senses. They imagine in sight and sound. That's it. That's the only two is their imagination isn't in five senses. But think how much richer your out-of-body experiences would be if you could intuitively process smell and taste and feeling data just as easily as you do sight and sound. I mean, sometimes we do. Sometimes out of body you get you get things that are sent, you know, that are what uh, textured feeling things and so on. But that's the that's at the 10% level. That's not main, mainly it's sight and sound, you know, information. You just get information back. And the sights and sounds necessary to give you that information is basically the sights and sounds you get. But if, you ha if you're adept at imagining in five senses, now you've got this much richer landscape in which you can work. And it's a richer landscape in which the system can work with you. So now the system can send you a data stream that's got feeling and smell and, you know, those kinds of things in it, taste. So that's what's going on. It sounds like fun, doesn't it? Sounds like a lot of fun. It yeah. So it's just a tool for people to use like any other tool. You know, tools are things we make up. But they help us focus our intent to do something, you know, to create something, to be able to heal. You know, you take your energy bar tool and you get rid of all the black stuff that is the symbol for the not healthy. So that's a tool. You know, there is no black stuff. It's just a symbol for something. And by getting rid of that symbol, you actually focus your intent on healing. Whereas if you just didn't have that tool and said, oh, just heal, it mostly wouldn't work because people wouldn't feel like they actually were doing anything there. Mm -hmm. They wouldn't feel like right. it was, it'd be too easy. Right. See, so you have to use tools that, that are metaphors and the metaphor has to be something that you connect to. That's why there's so many healing modalities because there's all sorts of different metaphors. Some people connect to this metaphor. Some people connect to that metaphor. So some people use their light, bars to get rid of black stuff and other people don't do that they use something else they use a symbol for healing or a color for healing or something else and the tool itself is is not fundamental it's just a way to help us develop a clear well-focused state with enough energy in it to change things you know to make a difference and if it's just oh change that's just too easy and we don't put we can't put the energy in it we can't get the emotion and the feeling and the you know when you're healing you really have to care about people if you're just going through the motions it doesn't work well you have to be a person who cares and speaking of that the other good thing about learning to do paranormal things is that the thing that gets in the way of people doing paranormal things after the intellect the next biggest thing is fear. If you have fear, any kinds of fear, any kinds of ego, and your beliefs, all of those get in the way. So in order to do paranormal things well, you have to get rid of fear, ego, and belief, which is really all about growing up. So people who, who do these things tend to be more grown up if they do them fully.
wholly, not just dabble in one particular piece of it, but if they get into it seriously, then they tend to be a little more grown up than other people. So I see the paranormal stuff not as not being important in themselves, but being a good tool, a good ex set of exercises for people to grow up. So you don't, when I teach people how to do these paranormal things, I don't teach them that paranormal is really cool because you can do all these cool things. I say the paranormal is neither here nor there. But practicing doing paranormal things will develop your intuitive side and will help you get rid of fear. The way it helps you get rid of fear is that it gives you a bigger picture. Now suddenly your picture is not so little anymore. And when your picture gets bigger, well, you become a little smaller <laughs> and you realize that you're just a, you know, you know, a player in something that's much larger than just this physical reality. There's something bigger going on, more meaningful, more significant. And that's humbling. And humble is good because humble is the antidote to ego. You know, so humble is a good thing. Having big picture is a good thing because that lets you put things into context. So if you're stuck in a little picture, you're like in a soap opera. You're making mountains out of molehills all the time. Oh, no. Oh, no. You know, my cat is lost or whatever. You know, and it, it, you just make these big mountains out of molehills. Once you have a bigger picture, you tend not to do that. When you have a little picture, you're terrified of death. And when you have a big picture, you realize there is no death to consciousness because you've been in consciousness. You've, you've experienced it from the other side. So there's just lots of things that are advantages to growing up and having bigger pictures. It helps you not be frazzled, not have anxiety attacks. It helps you be relaxed. It helps you live in very quarrelless times like we have now and still be happy and find joy in them. Whereas you get sucked up into the little picture of do this. No, don't do that. Then, you know, your life is full of anger and full of annoyance and, ang you, know, you know, it's just not, it's not fun. So growing up, getting bigger pictures, learning how to let go of fear, ego, and belief is a, very good thing to do. And meanwhile, you do learn these paranormal things, which are kind of fun to do anyway, you know, to play with. To, you have to convince yourself, of course, that they're true. You know, you have to remote view and say, and, you know, get that target where you get that very complex target and you see it and you describe it and there it is. Well, then that starts to develop confidence that you really are connecting with something larger. So getting Truth data that you can verify, getting verifiable results are important. <clears throat> and in my courses, you know, we kind of focus on verifiable results. If you're going to communicate with somebody telepathically, well, you need to verify, did they get that message? You know, you need to verify, was it a, you know, what did the conversation really take place? If you're going to talk to your dead Uncle Fred, then it's good to find out information about his wife, your Aunt Susie, that you don't know, but Uncle Fred does. And then go talk to Aunt Susie and see if that information is correct. You know, things like that. So there's lots of things you can do that are evidential. And that's, an, that's the, the kind of the first step. You have to do enough evidential things until you convince yourself that you are really doing something that is real. You're getting real information. And then you begin to see that the you know, the things you do like out of body, they actually have lessons in them. They're not just, you know, a fun trip to the woods and back, you know, you know, hiking on a trail to get a nice view. They actually have usually ethical or moral or big picture lessons to help you understand reality. And once you see that, you start learning things. And now you have to check those things out. Do these things make sense? You see, so you have to build your own toe, your own theory of everything based on your own experience. That's the point. Don't believe my big toe. Create your own big toe based on your experience. And once you get to the point where you can travel around in the bigger picture, that becomes not so hard anymore. Until you do that, it's impossible because you don't know the big picture. 
all of those things, you know, the big questions, you know, why am I here? You know, what's the purpose of life? And, you know, where, how do I, you know, how do I become a happy, you know, joyful person? Uh, how do I make my relationships work out really well? You know, all those kinds of things, they don't have any answers to you as long as you're stuck in this little reality frame. Once you go out and see bigger pictures and understand all those things, how they work and why they work, well, that just makes your whole life here so much easier and happier. So that's the that's kind of the point of it all. It's not just a wow, you can remote view or you can, you know, talk to dead people or you know, you can help talk to, you know, your teenagers telepathically in ways that don't create that pushback that they do if it's face to face and uh, you have to grow up. Like if you're going to talk to people telepathically, you have to realize that you cannot Try to manipulate them that way. You must just talk to them out of caring and out of love and help them maybe see bigger pictures, but don't encourage them even to do what you think they should do. You have to be very careful to let them make their own free will choices. You be part of their solution, because if you start making choices for them or pushing them or nudging them or you know, in the choices that you, you know are best for them, that's not helpful. They grow up by making their own choices and making their own mistakes and learning from them. And besides, they will know that you're manipulating them. And though they won't intellectually be able to say, you're trying to manipulate me, they'll know it at an intuitive level, and they will trust you less. So it backfires when you try to manipulate people. Yes, yeah, sometimes you'll get your way, but it will bite you in the end. It's always like that when you do things out of fear and, you know, force control, you know, manipulation, power. When you come on from that ego, fear, belief place, everything you do tends to turn out badly. It bites you in the end. So, and you learn that once you uh, are able to use these tools effectively, that you need to use them wisely. That's an important part of it. So that's what's going on in, in Tom Campbell's world is uh, Tom's Park is about to launch. And I'm hoping that it will be very helpful to all of my left brain logical process friends out there who struggle with their intellect. Now, most of them do have successes, but they're intermittent. You know, when they just happen to be at the right mood at the right time, you know, in the right place, then bingo, something happens and they get a remote view dead on. But the next 20 times they try, nothing. Because once they get it, they say, oh, I can do this. And now their intellect gets up and tries harder, you know. And with the intuition, if you try hard, you won't succeed. You need to, you know, it's like these Zen things, right? Clap the one, you know, the sound of one hand clapping. Well, in, in, with intuition, you have to, you know, you have to do without trying. You have to, you have to be. It's not about doing. It's about being. And the more you try to make it come out in a particular way or do a particular thing, it doesn't happen because that's your intellect trying to make something happen. And you don't make things happen intuitively. You let things happen <laughs> intuitively. You just have to be open to them and have a quiet, still, open mind, which you learn how to have by usually practicing meditation is how you get that still, quiet, calm mind. So it's kind of exciting. I hope it works well for people. I think what will happen is people will have a lot of fun in any case. But I think some who actually do use it regularly will make a lot of progress through the imagination that they just don't seem to be making any other way. You see, that imagination is another, is a very powerful tool, and we kind of blow it off in our culture. The imagination is a fake thing. You know, it's, it's nothing to it. It's just made up fake stuff. This physical reality, that's the real reality. <laughs> but, you know, it's not like that. Consciousness, if if you are if you're in any reality where you're experiencing something which you do in a dream you do in this physical universe you do in your imagination you can experience things mm -hmm. any reality in which you experience things is a virtual reality it's just a matter of 
where are the data streams coming from? When it's your own imagination, you're creating the data stream. Well, your consciousness, you can create data streams. The larger conscious system that's conscious, it can create data streams. But because it's also the operating system, it can share its data streams with other individual units of consciousness, where your imaginative data stream is just yours. You can't just directly share that with somebody else. But you can if you're the if you're the LCS. So your dream reality, your daydreams, your night dreams are all virtual realities. Right. And the thing about a virtual reality is, is none is more or less real than the other. This physical universe of ours is no more real than your dreams. It's just different, mm -hmm. has different rule set. It's good for different sorts of things. It gives you a place to experience things that you wouldn't experience here. It lets you actually show and demonstrate and express who you are. Whereas here, you tend to keep that under wraps and lead with your image <clears throat> and your learned behavior and your politeness and all the other social skills that we learn. In your dreams, you just are the way you are. You know, you're working right out of your being level there. So all these virtual realities have value. There's lessons in them. Well, most of the out of bodies come with with lessons, things to learn, things to to realize, and uh, so if you realize that there's nothing more real than information, that's the data stream. Then this your imagination is you creating a virtual reality for yourself. That's what imagination is, and your intent is a very powerful thing. That intent can heal, can gather information, do all sorts of things. So if this virtual reality you lead yourself or you create for yourself ends up helping you, you know, is a tool that helps you heal, gather information, be useful to people, you know, find happiness and improve relationships. If it helps you do that, then it's a very valuable tool. And the fact that it is imagination based does not make it fake or insignificant. That's just, you know, bias. Right. That's, that's just uh, arrogance, I guess. There's another way of saying it, you know, all these virtual realities are, are real. They're just different. Right. But the, you're conscious in all of them. And you evolve or de-evolve by the quality of your choices. And it doesn't matter what reality you're in. If you do something nasty in a dream, that is will de-evolve your consciousness. Mm -hmm. Just like you do something nasty here in this reality. It makes no difference about the reality. It's your choice that helps you evolve or de-evolve. The same in a daydream. If you do something abusive in a daydream, well, <clears throat> that will help you de-evolve. If you do something kind and nice in a daydream, that will help you evolve. Realities are realities. Choices are choices. It's not like choices in a daydream don't count because it's only a daydream. They count just as much. <clears throat> just as much as any reality. So those so, times we're thinking about the other person that we're really angry at and putting all this energy into it. That's what you're talking about is a daydream? <laughs> <laughs> that's one, yes. If you're putting all that energy into it and that energy is negative, then that de-evolves you. And, you know, for anybody who's done that, they will realize that afterwards, they don't feel better. They feel worse. You know, they think that by venting all that anger, that they'll feel better. But it doesn't work that way. You're actually de-evolving. And when you're done venting all that anger, you feel more empty and more alone and, and lower and more, you know, you just feel worse than you did before you started because you're going in the wrong direction. Absolutely. Yes, all the things you do, it's not like, uh, oh, it's only a virtual reality, so it doesn't matter what you do. <laughs> you know, that's just uh, the opposite. It matters very much what you do in your dreams, in your imagination, and when you're out of body. They all contribute to the quality of your, of your consciousness. There is no place where you get to run around and be a, you know, a, a berserker criminal and it doesn't count. Right. 
You know, it's not like that. It's the choices you make. Now, if you're playing a video game where, you know, you're a berserker criminal, then as long as you see that as a game and it is not you making a choice in a reality, then the damage is probably slight. It's probably not zero, but it's slight. It's less. It's something you can walk away from. But if you actually get into that virtual reality game, like you're there, I mean, you're really, you know, again, it becomes a reality for you. You're not just playing a game, but you are that person. Then it does damage to you. So those kinds of games can be damaging, depending on how deeply you get committed to them. Now, most players don't get that deeply committed. They know they're just playing a game, and it's very superficial. And, you know, you don't lose a lot of points for doing something like that. So it's not really too hurtful. But for those who get obsessed with it, get sunk deeply into it to where they don't really differentiate between they're just playing a game or they're just in some other alternative reality, then they can be damaged by that sort of thing. Choices are choices, no matter where you make them. If they're seriously your choice, the way you would act in this reality, then it yeah. can it can damage you. So yeah, that anger that you get, and you, and you, you rail at somebody, and you think of all the horrible things that you might like to do to them, and they're all ah, uh, there they are falling in a hole, yay, you know, and you do all that. You come out the other side more miserable than when you started. It's just not. It's just not useful. So, maybe Tom's Park will be a, a good thing to you know to play with when it comes out. How do we find it? How does it? How does it work? Well, it doesn't exist just yet. Like I say, it's going to come out in a few weeks to a month. It's going to be on Kindle, and it's going to probably be in a in a, a book, um, you know, pod a pod book at Amazon. Ebook, uh, uh, yeah. Well, Kindle's an ebook, right? Yeah, Kindle's an ebook, but it's also be a actual paper book too if you wanted to buy it that way. Okay. Um, and inside this, it's not only just the park, but there's lots of directions inside that tell you, you know, how it works, why it works, what to do, how to how to connect. You know, that you have to do it iteratively. It's not just a one-time shot. That you can form relationships with the staff in this park. Matter of fact, you should form relationships with the staff at this park. You know, that, that'll be a relationship of somebody who will always be there when you need them. You know, the park is very safe. The park has nothing in it that can hurt you. Even the lake, you can't drown in it. It's impossible to drown in it. You cannot drown in it. If you were to... Go up in the high country and and trip and fall over a cliff. You just float to the ground. <laughs> it's impossible to be hurt. All the animals there. There's some big animals, but all of the animals are friendly. Most of them will talk. Um, there's nothing that'll sting. There's nothing that'll irritate. You can even lie down on the lawn, and the grass won't make you itch. You know, it's uh, there's nothing there that irritates, hurts, or mm -hmm. is dangerous. You can't even get lost. There's a, uh, the park has this, <clears throat> has this return function that wherever you are, and maybe you've just gone too far and you need to go back, but you're running out of time, you know, yet you've been riding your horse, you know, for an hour in one direction. You think, oh, it's going to take me an hour to get back. Now, all you have to do is go through this little sequence, uh, little sequence that you do, and poof, you're back. So you always can come back and you can't ever get lost. Cool. Whenever you want to, you can you can return to the so park. So we'll show well, it'll have a map and you yeah. can play and so it's it's not online, it's just in the book. Yeah, it's all in your head. Okay. The whole okay. thing exists in your head. So you get the you get the book the ebook or the book and you'll see how to do it what the what the instructions are you know you cannot um take advantage of the staff you know it's all oh, they're just pretend staff they're not really real people no this is a reality you treat them like you would treat anybody else you know these are real people and if you are a quality person 
you're very likely to make friends here that last a long time. Nice. You know, you can make lifetime friends here that uh, can be very helpful to you. Again, we waste our imagination in this culture. We throw it out as as trivial and as fake. And it's a very, very valuable tool for us, a very valuable tool. And we just don't bother with it because we're materialists and we think that uh, anything other than our physical reality isn't important. It's just imaginary and therefore fake. Imaginary is very powerful. You're a consciousness and consciousness can create virtual realities. And in those virtual realities, your choice is as meaningful there as it is any place. And the people you meet there can be as meaningful to you as people you meet anywhere. Wow. That sounds so cool. <laughs> yeah. Very, very interesting. Yeah. So it's going to, you know, we haven't yet priced it, what it'll be, but I'm I'm going for a low price because I think it'll it there'll be a lot of people who will who will get a lot out of it. Yeah. So it won't be much. I, you know, I, pro- I shouldn't say anything because if I do, it'll be wrong because we haven't decided on it yet. But right. I'm going to try to I'm going to try to keep it low so that it's you know Affordable. not much more than a you know than a, than a dinner at an expensive restaurant. You know that kind of thing. You know something that's yeah, it's a little pricey, park. but huh? A park admission if you're going <laughs> to. Uh... Yeah. To yeah. Disneyland or something. Yeah, right. It's no more than no more than it would cost you to get into Disneyland. Like, right. So around that kind of a price point, that is, yeah, a little. You know, I mean, it's not trivial, but it's really not a big deal either. You know, it's something that if you want to do it, you can afford it. <clears throat> so that's the way we're we're going to do it. So no, it's not going to be anything that you can do online. It's right. going to be uh, you buy the book, you read it, which gives you all the how to's and what nots to do, what to do, what all the various, you know, how how do you get that dark, how do you get that heavy stuff off of you when you get into that hot spring and get out without it? Let it stay in the water and dis- and dissolve, and you come out feeling light and easy. There's a little technique to that. So it tells you all the techniques and how to use the various things. And, you know, it's so it's so broad and there's so much to it that you can't go there with the idea, oh, I'm going to do everything. You know, well, Disneyland's like that. You can't, you can't do everything there. You got to say, well, we're going to do this, this, and this, and we'll have to come back tomorrow to do the other stuff. Well, it's like this even, even more so. There's more in my park than in Disneyland. You know, there's more kind of different things to do and things that take time to do. The, the, the things to do there are not just five-minute things like in Disneyland. They're things that could take hours to do so 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 you have to decide it's just going to do this and you go do that and then you do something else and you do something else so you could spend you know a year and not do everything i think that was there if you really you know dig into the stuff that's that's there and one other thing i should say is i have two or three places i tell people don't become obsessed with the park don't get to where the park is more of your life than right. here. That would be a big mistake. No more than maybe an hour a day. That's kind of maxed out in a park. You have to live your life here. You cannot live your life there, even if the life there is so much more productive and less of a hassle and more fun and you know more joyous. That's not where you know your primary reality is. Your primary reality is here. So I, I make that, I stress that various places is you, you know, limit yourself to no more than an hour a day. That's plenty. Any more than that is probably not healthy. It's not a place, you know, and, and that's, you know, there may be times when you'd use it three or four hours, five or six days in a row, because you, that's just where your needs are now. But I just mean in general, there may be times when you don't use it for months. You just never go there. But my point is don't, get so involved in it that your relationships in the park are more important than your relationships here, because then that's a trap also. Right. So I don't want anybody to get trapped by it. And I know that probably once you put something out in the public, there will be some people who won't take that advice and will get trapped by it, but that's unfortunate that that won't be good for them. Wow. 
Well, this is exciting. I can't wait for it to come out. <laughs> it sounds it sounds like a lot of fun. I'm mean, that's yeah. We'll have to do a show like a couple months after it's out and see how uh, what mm -hmm. my experiences have been in the uh, yeah. In the well, you know, part. yeah, a couple of months you could just be working on you know your sense data, or yeah. you could be working on feeling or doing things that you do to see maybe if there's some tools or things that you could use in in your work. Yeah. you know, or, or help your clients, yeah. you know, you could, they could go get a park and you could give them homework in the park, go and do these things. You know, it, it could work that way too. Sure. Um, people could use it that don't have any interest whatsoever in paranormal just because they want to improve their creative side, mm -hmm. just because they're looking for inspiration, just because they'd like to improve their intuition just because they'd like to see bigger pictures, you know, that kind of thing. It doesn't have to be about the paranormal. It can be just about opening up your mind to allow yourself to get out of the box and not just be always stuck in the box. So it's, it's basically a mind opener, I, I would say, and it works with imagination, which everybody has. <laughs> All right, well, this has been a great show. Uh, you've been listening to News for the Heart. We've been getting to the heart of what matters with Tom Campbell and Tom's Park. <laughs> New tools for the consciousness. I love yes. it. Yes. All right. <clears throat> Tom.